On July 12, 2020, the USS Bonhomme Richard caught fire in San Diego, California. Over the next five days, the world watches a major U.S. Navy combatant burned in port. The Navy faces a tough public relations challenge in dealing with the aftermath of the fire on board the vessel. Today on the Nason Video Podcast, we're joined by Ryan Wadley and his book, Selling Sea Power, Public Relations in the U.S. Navy, 1917 to 1941. Selling Sea Power earned the honorable mention this year for the John Lyman Prize. Perhaps there's something the Navy can learn by the Navy's efforts during the interwar years. North American Society for Oceanic History was created by maritime scholars who met in 1971 at the University of Maine. They recognized that in North America there was no forum for maritime history or a society devoted to the study and promotion of maritime history. The aim of the original group of organizers was to create a diverse organization based initially on Canadian and American membership, which would gain the interest of others. Now there are members worldwide. And it is this diversity of membership that continues to make NASO a truly unique organization. 2020 marked the first year in recent memory that NASA was unable to meet, and therefore we bring historians, archaeologists, and students who are scheduled to present. Welcome to the North American Society for Oceanic History video podcast. I'm your host, Sal Mercagliano. The goal of the NASA podcast is to bring you some of the best historians, professionals, and up-and-comers in the field of maritime history. Today, we're heading to Alabama. It's an old haunt for us so far, and we're being joined by Ryan, Ryan Wadley. He's a graduate of Texas A&M and currently an associate professor of comparative military studies at Air University at Maxwell Air Force Base. Dr. Wadley is the runner-up in this year's John Lyman Book Prize for Military and Naval History with his work, Selling Sea Power, Public Relations in the U.S. Navy, 1917 to 1941. Welcome, Ryan, to the NASO Video Podcast. And thank you for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. I'm very happy to have you, and uh, congratulations. Uh, Lyman Award is always a a big one for everybody, and and your book is definitely uh, well-recognized for that. Uh, You placed in the CNO History Essay Contest back in 2017 with, with I guess, a portion of this book, Mm -hmm. and now the full book is out there. It's a great read. I've enjoyed it immensely. I, I thought you're hitting on a topic that doesn't get a lot of attention. So I thought, uh, starting off, I'd just give you a, let you give a brief overview on, on why the topic, uh, why you chose it, and, and really kind of the thesis throughout your book. Okay. So, um, so as far as how the, the topic came to be, it's, uh, it's a rather long story to it, but I would say that, the, you know, one thing I had discovered in, in graduate school was, um, you know, as I was going through military history courses, naval history courses, I was much, always much more interested in, you know, uh, you know, how military organizations were preparing for what were they doing when they were not, you know, technically at war, you know, and, and so this is always what, what had, had really motivated me. So, so we would start talking about World War II. And, and so I would start thinking, asking myself the questions of like, okay, so, so, you know, how did they get to this point where they were either really prepared or not? Um, you know, and so, so it kind of, that, that interest kind of branched in a couple of different directions, but, uh, uh, but, you know, as I was, you know, trying to figure out like, how do I want to, uh, uh, you know, take this further and, 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 you know, take this into my dissertation. So, you know, I, I had already started taking some courses on film studies. I had been, uh, uh, my advisor, Dr. Jim Bradford, uh, he had, uh, put me in touch with the uh, Naval Order of the United States, and so I had done some processing of their papers. and And so the Naval Order, for those who don't know, is is a, a hereditary Naval Veterans uh, Society. Um, but one of the things that's really important about the the Naval Order is is some of their members, yeah, you know, because they were reluctant to to get into lobbying. The Naval Order uh, helps give birth to the Navy League in 1902. And so, because of these different connections, and because of my interest in peacetime, uh, you know. Uh, we all decided that that yeah, this this you know, looking at public relations in the interwar period would be a would be a great topic. And the fact that that there really hadn't been much work on this done in the past. Uh, there were a couple of naval officers who studied under Scott Cutlip. Scott Cutlip was a historian of public relations, and so he had uh, some military public affairs officers back in the '60s, uh, and two navy. So two of them were naval officers uh, who did. Um, 
projects, but there really hadn't been anything done in 50 years. And, and, and to be honest, one thing I, I very quickly discovered was there was a whole wealth of material that I don't think was available uh, in the mid 60s that is available now. Uh, even at the National Archives, to say nothing of, of, of other collections that are out there. And so, uh, so anyway, so that's how I got into the topic and, and quickly found that there was a lot, uh, a lot to be done with it. So this is, a, you start off with uh, the period, obviously, U.S. entry into World War I and, and yes. the situation facing the Navy in the First World War and immediately after First World War. This is an area that I've studied quite a bit. And, and one of the things that I, I've come to see in this, in this debate is, is, number one, the Navy in World War I, there's not a lot on it in, in terms of either true academic study or even popular history, I, I would argue. Mm -hmm. Just not a lot done with it. And then, of course, you have a, a bit of a controversy comes out of World War I with the fight between Josephus Daniels and, and, and Sims and the Naval Investigation reports. So, so why does public relations, and, and, and again, this has been dogging the Navy for a long time, too. You can go back to the Spanish-American War and Samson Shelley. The, the, the Navy just seems to eat its own after every conflict. Mm -hmm. and, and, and why does public relations become such a big issue uh, after or during First World War and immediately after it? Yeah, so so with, you know, with, with Secretary Daniels, so, you know, one of the things, you know, Josephus Daniels, uh, I, I have to say, even after spending several years, you know, studying the man, uh, I'm still not sure I have a, a, a good grasp of him. I mean, he's, he's a man of many contradictions. And, and so for, for, and, and for, for every move that I find that, that actually appears to be very smart and forward thinking, you find another, another uh, choice or policies, policies of decision that he's made that is, is um, questionable. Let's put it that way. You know, uh, it's, it's always general order 99 for me, but it, yes. it's others for other people. Yeah, I, 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 you know, I think that's where it stops and starts for most. But uh, so one of the interesting things that that I found was, you know, Daniels, you know, so Daniels has has a background as a uh, newspaper editor, and uh, you know, when he comes in uh, to uh, to to the second half uh, position, uh, he and in many ways functions as his own uh, public affairs officer for a while. Uh, eventually he appoints uh, a lieutenant to, to kind of serve as his press aide just before World War I. And then during the war uh, to, to coordinate with the Committee for Public Information, which is the big uh, wartime propaganda agency that's, that's there to sell the war uh, created by the Wilson administration, um, he creates the, uh, 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 the, the Navy Press Bureau uh, that is supposed to be, you know, kind of this this coordinating body, but really, in effect, becomes kind of this civilian-dominated uh, uh, public relations office, uh, directly attached to to Daniel's office. And so, in fact, I did find some evidence that apparently they were competing at times with with the CPI uh, for for space. And so, Daniel's really should get a lot of credit for for you know pushing public relations to to the forefront. But yet, at the same time, there's a lot of uh, policies that undermine that. So during the war, you know, Hollywood, you know, the Navy is starting to 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 develop a relationship with Hollywood. Um, and during the war, the the you know, Daniels really tries to clamp down on how much assistance they give to Hollywood productions. You know, so that closes off. Uh, Daniels and the Navy League get into a really nasty feud. You know, where the Navy League alleges that uh, a uh, an incident of sabotage had been covered up by the Navy which was uh, patently untrue. In this case, Daniels was in the right, but the effect was he pushes the Navy League, which is at this time kind of at the peak of its power, uh, kind of pushes them off to the side. And, and so for several years, the Navy League is basically functioning on starvation rations afterwards. And so at the same time, he's trying to, to, to you know, figure out a way to get the Navy to, to have a stronger connection to the public. He's, he's also enacting policies that undermine this. And then after the war, yeah, between the, the fights with Sims over the medals, over preparedness, uh, one of my personal favorites is the fact that in the middle of all of these controversies, uh, Sims, uh, uh, who at the time is the president of the Naval War College, uh, uh, gets in touch with uh, uh, an edit, a friendly editor uh, of, the, of the newspaper in Providence. And so this is how the Newport scandal uh, 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 you know, becomes a, uh, at least a, a Northeastern, if not a national scandal, you know, for those who aren't familiar with it, this is the, where, uh, you had untrained, uh, enlisted investigators, uh, initially doing, uh, uh, and, uh, they were investigating, um, 
drug use uh, and alleged uh, homosexuality uh, uh, at the at the base in Newport. And what really turns it into a scandal is not so much that the Navy is persecuting its own, at least from the press's point of view. What really happens is the the locals decide that this is working so well that uh, they want the Navy to start uh, investigating local citizens. And an Episcopalian priest gets caught up in 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 this uh, in this matter. So this is how it becomes a a major scandal. There's Senate investigations. Roosevelt, uh, you know, is involved in in approving the investigation. And so this doesn't really help either. But the biggest thing that really shapes the the Navy's image after the war is the public's perception that, that navies had helped fuel uh, the, the, the geopolitical uh, climate uh, that had uh, started the war in the first place. And so as the Navy is really trying to push for, for more naval construction, you know, uh, completing the, the 1916 program, uh, which called for 10 battleships, uh, six battle cruisers, and, and several dozen other smaller ships, the Navy is pushing to complete that program. For a time, uh, they try to double that uh, in another authorization, but that's traded away at, at Paris to get the British to sign on to the Navy League. And so as the Navy is trying to, to build this larger fleet, they're really unable to articulate why they need this larger fleet in the first place. And at times, you see the justification uh, uh, coming down to, well, you know, if the League fails, then we need to be able to protect ourselves. Um, you know, but maybe this will serve as the, the, the nucleus for a, a League of Nations Navy. And, and so the, 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 the public never really buys into this. And so in, in um, uh, 1920, uh, you really see the, the, the tide against naval construction turn. The, the New York World, which is uh, Joseph Pulitzer's uh, former newspaper, his sons were in charge at the time. Uh, comes out with a big editorial uh, denouncing naval construction. William Bora uh, soon afterwards will denounce, you know, the idea of, of doing this construction program on the Senate floor. And almost immediately you have this big, you know, uh, widespread social and political movement that comes out in favor of naval disarmament. And, and so in some of this, you know, it's, some of this is conditions created by the war that, that obviously the Navy couldn't can affect. But at times, you know, this was the Navy not really doing a good job of articulating you know, what is what is the navy to be used for what is was what, what is its value you know and why do we need these ships you know if if all if the only uh, uh nations left that that have uh navies you know any respectable navies are the british and the japanese who were, were our allies during the war it, it's really interesting a couple of points uh we had uh, uh, heather haley on uh recently and she's a grad student from auburn mm -hmm. and she was uh she actually uh, talked about the newport scandal as part of her research a really interesting uh topic if anyone wants to take a, go back and take a look at that i really recommend that but going back to to, to this it, i mean again it's really amazing to me because again like as you mentioned josephus daniels is the editor of the, of the news and observer in raleigh he's a newspaper man by training so you would think that public relations and press would be good. And, and I, I would argue that he does that to a certain extent. Guys like Robert Payne get on board ships. They write about the success of, of, of the Navy. But in, in many ways, uh, it almost seems like the Navy gets so focused on the big ships, they lose what succeeded in World War I, the smaller vessels. And because and, I think they had tremendous success. I think they were, they were a big game changer mm -hmm. in, in many ways. And, and almost like you're saying is, yeah, the, the, maybe the big power confrontation is over, but that asymmetric warfare that the Germans used against us is still going to be present. Yet the Navy never seems to want to make that argument. They, they want, they're, they're so fixated on the big, large capital ships that they, they seem to, to, to lose that. And then we, we roll into this next topic, which I, which I think is, a, is another interesting one, is a series of really kind of tragedies that befall the Navy during the, the 1920s. And, you know, we're, we're doing this. It's, it's mid-July and, and, and past evening. I've been up because of the incident that's been going on board, on, a fire on board the Bonhomme Richard, uh, which has been, uh, had a fire on board in San Diego, just really gutting the ship right now. Uh, but during this period of time, 1920s and 30s, the Navy suffers a series of, of setbacks that they have to overcome. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how the Navy deals with the bad press in some cases and, and, and how they start really trying to spin that turnaround. And, and I, sh I shouldn't use spin, but really get their message out to the public in general. Sure. Yeah. So um, so one of the things that happens in the wake of, of the Washington Conference, which is the, the, you know, the, the end result of, of that disarmament movement, is you know even as the conference is going on, the Navy finally uh, realizes that they need a peacetime public relations organization. Daniel's uh, uh, old um, old office had been 
uh, was the victim of budget cuts and then it was disbanded. So, so at the time, you know, this, all, all of this talk of disarmament is going on, the Navy doesn't really have much of a, of a uh, public relations presence uh, or organization out there. And so Washington finally convinces them. And so there's a lot of growing pains that, that you see in this office. And, and one, of the, one of the things that I found that was a useful way of, of tracking the kind of the professional progress of, of the, uh, uh, of the uh, of Navy public relations was how did they respond to accidents? And so one of the first ones that, that, uh, uh, that I looked at was uh, the, the, the accident at Honda Point uh, in uh, September of 1923. And so for those who aren't familiar with it, uh, basically an entire destroyer squadron runs aground uh, uh, at Honda Point, which is just north of the Santa Barbara Channel. Uh, basically the, the, the destroyers were, were uh, making a, a nighttime speed run uh, along the California coast, it was foggy. Uh, and so they were doing, uh, and so they, they did, basically there was a navigational error, they turned too soon, so they weren't at the channel yet. And so, and they were also basically playing follow the leader. And so the ships all end up running aground uh, on, on the coast. And so, yeah, there's the, you can see the photo there. And, and it's, it's you know, one of, the, one of the, 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 the more, I would say, uh, interesting sites that I think I've ever seen, you know, and, uh, as, you know, in terms of, of looking at, at, at images of, of Navy accidents. And so the Navy gets a lot of, uh, bad press in the wake of this, just because the, and, and it really comes down to the fact that, that news about the accident trickles out. Uh, there's no real coordinated press, uh, presence. Uh, in fact, it, it's, it's, uh, the, it takes a day or two for the first press release to come out. And even then it only really kind of addresses some side issues on this. And so, and, and so one of the things you see in some of the articles that come out after Honda Point is there are gradually more, uh, more and more ships uh, are known to have been involved until finally you get to the, to, to the true number, which is I think 11. And so the fact that that news trickles out now, some of this is because of a, uh, at least a, 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 somewhat laudable reason uh the captain in charge of of the uh the, the squadron had decided what he wanted to do was uh wait until he had all the damage reports in before he submitted uh his report and that's what the navy was at least using some of that report uh to 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 you know kind of uh, shape some of their press releases well yeah that didn't come in for for many days afterwards and so so that caused all sorts of problems and so it was really only the fact that the navy decided to throw open the 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 inquiry to the press you know the inquiry into the disaster afterwards uh that's really only when the navy finally starts to get a handle on on i would say the the image you know the 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 reaction to that situation and so then you see a series of other accidents in the 20s. You know, there, there are many accidents I didn't cover, but I tried to focus on, on, on a few in particular. So there's, in September of 1925, within the span of three weeks, uh, you have the, the near disappearance of the PN9 flying boat as it's trying to fly from California to Hawaii. Uh, just as the flying boat goes missing, the Shenandoah crashes in Ohio, uh, the airship, uh, and it kills a couple dozen crewmen, including the captain, uh, uh, of, of the ship, and then uh, and then about three weeks later, uh, the S-51, the uh, submarine, uh, 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 is involved in a collision with a civilian steamer uh, off the coast of New England, and and uh, is rammed, and uh, all but three of the three of the crew members drown in that accident. And so, you know, seeing the uh, then later the the S-4 is sunk uh, in 1927 with a uh, uh, in a collision with a uh, with a rum runner, uh, uh, or or, a co or it was a Coast Guard ship trying to chase a rum runner, uh, and then you know there's the crash of the Akron, and then and then I cap off with talking about the the the, the accident with the Squalus in May of 1939, and so you can definitely see a progression in terms of the Navy realizes that that getting as much information out there fast helps. Do not try to hide information. Uh, there's a great anecdote that I found in in uh, uh, in, in an interview with uh, Bernard Austin. Bernard Austin's in the uh, um, public relations branch in the late 1930s. And so he mentions the fact that apparently in, in, uh, at the uh, accident site for the S4 in 1927, there's a group of newsmen who have uh, uh, hired a lobster boat to come out to the, to the crash site to see what's going on. 
And uh, as soon as one of the Navy vessels, uh, uh, the salvage crew, uh, sees them, they train fire hoses on them to, to drive them away. You know, and so you know, the, the Navy was really not interested. But it, contrast that with what you see at the time of the Squalus. So almost immediately, as soon as the Squalus goes down, you know, it helps that, that by this time the Navy has developed rescue equipment uh, that, that, can, that can save the surviving crewmen. You know, and so the, those those assets are on scene uh, very quickly, and so they're able to rescue the crew. Um, but it also helps that the Navy they basically set up like a press office at the Portsmouth Naval Yard to to handle all of the the, the press inquiries. They're constantly making sure that they're meeting the, the newsmen's deadlines. Uh, they're holding regular updates. Uh, they allow newsreel uh, crews out at the scene and and all sorts of other uh, other uh, uh, reporters. And so, yeah, so one of the things I found was like, yeah, the Navy's actually getting praise in the press for their handling of the accident and for essentially making the, the, the media's job uh, a whole lot easier during this, as, you know, compared to their performance in past accidents. And so, yeah, there is a definite, definite growth, but um, yeah, there's a, you know, it, there's obviously a lot of life and treasure and, and, and good equipment that, that has to be lost for the Navy to learn these lessons. I, I thought you're demonstration i mean if you, if you follow the arc in your book which is <clears throat> again I, I strongly recommend to everybody you know when you go from honda point all the way to squalus for example it, it's night and day difference between how they handle the news media and, and again I, I don't think this is unique to the navy either it's unique to any almost any organization the concept of getting the information out being supportive and 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 you know getting a positive you know as positive a spin or more importantly not not lying or, or holding anything you know i i i've a long time i've i've worked in 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 firefighting for a long time as a volunteer and as a paid firefighter and i had a guy a chief a very old chief tell me one time that that the, the press if you leave them by themselves they will make stuff up or they'll 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 release whatever they want to release you know you need to control the flow even yeah. if it's going out there every hour to tell them nothing's changed you do that because if not They'll start spinning whatever they want. And I think, I think that's something you see here, like you said, over the progression of this period of time, the Navy really learns how to do that with, with obviously disasters. And I mean, I, I, mean I, I would say we're seeing that right now unfold real time, watching a news conference I saw yesterday with an admiral talking about the Bonham Richard and, and, and what he said was going on versus what's actually being visualized going on. Mm -hmm. The concept that the admiral said that the ship will sail again, it goes against what, everything you're seeing of the vessel right now, which doesn't do anything but really question what comes out of his mouth and, and the Navy's mouth going forward, which I think is, is what you're showing here historically. And, and, and the Navy, let, let me put it this way, how had the Navy improved their position then by the eve of, of World War II. There's a lot of methods that the Navy looks at to, to begin to improve their methods, to really get their relations out. And I know you talk about this in the conclusion. I don't want to get to the end quite yet. So let, let's maybe talk about it. one piece, which I think is a really interesting one, is, is how the public perceives the Navy through things like cinema and, and movies. Yeah. Yeah, so, so you know, the Navy had, had worked on and off with Hollywood, you know, going back to the birth of, of film as a medium. Uh, but one of the things that that really kind of limits that that is, you know, film is is initially not seen as a respectable medium. Um, you know, it's really not until the 19 teens that it really starts to come come into its own. You know, you have things like uh, Bir uh, uh, Birth of a Nation, yeah, you know, which is horribly racist, but in terms of its 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 uh, you know the, the 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 quality of the the visual quality, the story, the the the, the storytelling. You know, it really uh, kind of elevates film uh, in a way that hadn't been done before. You know, some of this is a business reason that the, the film industry was controlled by a trust that was actually kind of related to Thomas Edison. And, you know, and so the, the film industry is, is kind of, it's got its own issues. And it doesn't help that the public, you know, the, the respectable public uh, generally sees film as this is the kind of the, the, the kind of thing that you only really engage in if you're either poor or a pervert, you know, because pornography has been a part of film ever since, since its birth. And so, you know, it doesn't really, so, so early cinema does not really escape kind of that, that image. It's kind of a novelty. And so, you know, by the twenties, you know, you have the emergence of the studio system. There's, there's the big five. And so, you know, there's really not a lot of movies made about the Navy in the early 20s. I think some of this is a reaction to the war. Some of this is just kind of a hangover of Daniel's policy of not really wanting to work with the studios. But by the mid 20s, uh, you know, the film going audience, it becomes more interested in seeing films about war and about about the military and about the Navy. Uh, so you have things like uh, What Price Glory, uh, 
uh, The Big Parade, which is a great movie. It's King Vidor's uh, early war epic. And so in the wake of this, you start to see some smaller films. And so the, the Navy allows a film to be uh, shot at the Naval Academy in 1925 called The Midshipman with Ramon Navarro, who's a big silent film star. And the Navy's so interested in getting the, uh, in, in, in wanting the Naval Academy to display that they allow Navarro to participate in the graduation ceremony that year. And so he gets a fake diploma. Uh, so that way it can be filmed. And so in the wake of that, you start to see more and more films. And so it, by 1928, 29, the Navy's getting so many requests for cooperation that they realize they need to set up a, a, a mechanism to control this. And so, uh, so the information section, which is the Navy's public, uh, public relations office, which is part of the Office of Naval Intelligence, which is its own story, uh, is kind of takes the lead on this. They work with the recruiting bureau and some of the other uh, parts of the Navy bureaucracy. And they're the ones in charge with reviewing scripts. And, and stories and figuring out, is this the kind of thing the Navy wants to put its name to and, and wants to support, uh, you know, with, with uh, either ships or, or, or sailors. And so, you know, the, this, and so, but by then, you know, Hollywood, you know, they, the, they, they're seeking more respectability. They want middle-class audiences. You know, so this works for them. The Navy is also trying to improve its own image. You know, the Navy, you know, especially sailors, you know, the image of sailors is, is, has generally been poor uh, over time. And so the Navy's trying to move past that stereotype of, of, of sailors as just drunken uh, uh, waterside, uh, pierside dregs and, and try to show sailors as being, you know, upstanding, you know, uh, respectable American citizens. And so, you know, there's a lot of synergy uh, that, that emerges at the same time. And one of the things I would also say about this, you know, in terms of the methodology, film is one of the best ways that, that I found that you could get a sense of how the Navy conceptualizes uh, its, its image. You know, because a lot of times, one of the things I discovered is, is when they're dealing with uh, the newspapers, I, I think a lot of those uh, contacts were handled in person over the telephone. You know, those aren't well documented. But Hollywood is, is you know, and, and cinema, it's, it's an industrial uh, medium. You know, there are dozens of people who have to participate and just because of the lead time with this. And so the, just the depth of correspondence that you get in the, in the, in the Navy records really gets at, at what is the Navy concerned with? What kinds of things do they want, uh, do they want the public to see about them? And so this, this, this uh, partnership really becomes uh, really comes into its, into its own in the 1930s. You know, once you have the, the Navy Motion Picture Board uh, 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 in place, you know, to review all these scripts and to kind of regulate this relationship. And so, you know, some of the, one of the first big hits that comes out of this is uh, uh, Hell Divers comes out in late 1931 uh, with Wallace Beery and, and it's Clark Gable. It's one of his first big speaking roles. Uh, there's Here Comes the Navy with uh, Jim, uh, Jimmy Cagney and uh, Gloria Stewart, who most people may remember as uh, uh, old Rose from, from Titanic. You know, she took, she took a few decades off from her acting career and then comes back much later. Uh, you know, and there's, and there's many, many different films that come out. You know, some are about the Naval Academy, some are more or less sports movies, some are all about naval aviation. Hell Divers is one. Many of these are written by Frank Spig Weed, who had spent, uh, you know, the 1920s was one of the Navy's premier air racers, but he's paralyzed in an accident. And he comes back later as a, as a screenwriter. And so he's kind of helped do helping, you know, and he's friends with many, uh, many parts of uh, uh, many, many current uh, officers. And, and in fact, uh, uh, you know, uh, Rear Admiral uh, William Moffat, who's the head of the Navy, Navy's uh, Bureau of Aeronautics. You know, and so he's being encouraged to write these kinds of stories. And so, you know, so the Navy really has a lot of ways in which they can kind of influence Hollywood and, and, and try to get the Navy's image on screen. And, and, you know, at times there are some who question the, the utility of this. You know, some, think don't, some do not think this is a, an appropriate use of the Navy's time or energy. Others question whether or not, uh, you know, the Navy really wants to be involved with this because of security issues, hell divers in particular. Uh, uh, becomes uh, the center of some controversy because the Navy doesn't want its uh, arresting gear set up to be seen. And so uh, even after the film has premiered, the, the Navy pulls the prints from, from circulation and has a black bar inserted whenever you see ships landing on the Saratoga during the film. So this way, uh, it, you know, the Germans, the Japanese, you know, the British, whoever, yeah, they can't see how this is uh, how uh, how the Navy is uh, uh, catching its planes on 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 the carrier deck. 
I think it's really interesting insight. I, I mean, like you said, those movies from the 1930s, I think are, are fascinating because they give you such a, a unique perspective of the Navy you don't get. I, I mean, you actually see things that are just, you know, squadrons of ships, uh, squadrons of planes on ships, battleships. I mean, just really amazing. If, if you ever get a chance to really look at some of these older movies, it just the access they had was phenomenal. And, and again, Spig Wig Weave to me is always John Wayne. I have a hard time thinking yeah. of him as anyone else other than him and Maureen O'Hara in that movie. Uh, you had two themes in the, in, that you talked about in the book, too, that deal with this that I'm really interested in. One was masculinity, the, the kind of the, really the overarching kind of manliness that is the U.S. Navy that comes in this. And then the transformation of the Navy, which is really played a lot in a lot of these movies. Like you said, the aviation aspect, they love. They, they love that aspect of it. Some of it accurately, some of it not so accurately. I always remember the scene from Dive Bomber at the very end of them in that kind of scuba suit, you know, uh, yeah. deep diving suit, which is the most impractical thing I've ever seen put on screen. But I, I'm wondering how much is that Hollywood or is that the Navy really pushing the masculinity and the technological, you know, transformation side? Like you just said, they were hiding the arresting gear, but do they want to get this kind of transformative, you know, transformation going out to the public that, hey, you have a Navy that that is embracing technology? Yeah, so, so, I, I would say it comes from 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 kind of both both sides of that relationship. So on the masculinity side, you know, one of the things I, I get into is like, you know, the Navy's trying to cultivate this image of of sailors as being, you know, uh, you know, uh, it, you know, paragons of like respectable masculinity. So they're not, you know, they're not drunks, they're not dregs, uh, you know, they're not uh, kind of these these vagabonds who just happen to be aboard ship, um, you know. But they, uh, you know, and so this is you know, kind of links back to, you know, at the turn of the century when the Navy really starts to push for recruiting in, in inland areas, you know, on the, on the belief that, that, you know, boys from the heartland are going to be more respectable. They're, they're going to make for better sailors. It also helps that they speak English. And so, you know, one of the things that actually drives this is, uh, is uh, captains, ship captains at the time really disliked going below decks and uh, not being able to understand the languages that they're speaking, that the sailors were speaking. You know, there's a there's a huge percentage of of foreign born sailors on U.S. Navy vessels uh, in the late 19th century, and that percentage drops dramatically uh, in in the early 20th century. But the Navy's still still trying to get past that image. And so what you'll see sometimes in the negotiations for the script is is what sorts of behaviors will the Navy uh, uh, allow on screen. And so we'll use hell divers as, as, a, as a, as an example. So, uh, Wallace Beery plays this, uh, chief. He's a, he's a, uh, uh, kind of a backseat gunner and, and on, on a dive bomber. Uh, the best way to describe the movie is imagine top gun. If, if instead of focusing on Maverick, uh, you focus on goose and goose is a drunken burnout. And and so that's the that that's the way I would describe Wallace Beery's character. He's a he's an excellent sailor. Uh, you know he's he's a he's he's a dependable in in a in a in a good in a in a rough spot, but you know he's he's a drunk. He gets into fights. Um, you know he's he's at times trying to uh, loan money from 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 the officers. Yeah, you know, just to just to kind of keep himself afloat. And so the Navy is, so, so what the, so the Navy really kind of wants to sand off all of these rough edges of his character during the process, but eventually the compromise that they reach is let's let him go on screen kind of as this rough and tumble character. But what they, but, but what they make sure to show is that, you know, he's uh, having to face consequences for his actions, you know, so you do see him in the brig or in jail at times. Uh, you know, he's being, uh, uh, you know, reprimanded by, by, by his officers and, uh, and really show him as kind of the exception to the rule, you know, and, and so to show that his behavior is, is not, is, is not exactly tolerated uh, aboard ship, you know, and so, so you see, you know, hell divers and then here comes the Navy, Jimmy Cagney, he's this, there's a long story about why he eventually he joins the Navy, there's a story to, to why he does this. But he doesn't really take it seriously, and and gradually, what the film shows is that his exposure to the Navy and Navy culture uh, allows him to to kind of uh, appreciate naval service and and kind of patriotism, uh, and 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 kind of duty to his shipmates, responsibility to his shipmates uh, over the course of the film. And so there's there's you know. Th Going back to, to you know the beginning of, of Hollywood, you know this idea of like boys becoming men, you know is like one of the the most you know staple you know commonplace uh, uh, character arcs on screen. 
And, and so it just so happens as the Navy is really getting interested in, and trying to, to change the image of, of sailors, yeah, this is really one of the most commonplace plots you'll see in a film. And so it, it, it works uh, incredibly well you know, the, the, you know, what Hollywood wants and what the Navy wants in terms of like fusing these, these, what you would think of as like disparate values uh, together and, and come up with like a coherent entertaining product. Which, which I think just you know, interrupt just for a second, I think is an important thing. 1930s, you know, you're in the midst of the great depression. You really just don't want to get people to join the Navy because they have nothing else to do. You really want to try to get that higher caliber. And I, I think you hit that point very well when you talk about that. Yeah, and so the Navy, yeah, they they always trying to, you know, you can you can get, join the Navy for fitness, you can join the Navy for travel, you can join the Navy because it'll help you learn a trade. Uh, you know, they, there's really not a lot of recruiting done during the mid '30s. You still see posters being issued, um, but for the most part, recruiting there's not much being done. The retention rate uh, for enlisted personnel uh, once the depression starts is about 90, 95 percent, and so. <clears throat> You know, the Navy is, is in a position where they can keep the best of the best, you know, and so this actually, I think one of the things that helps the Navy going into World War II is the Depression actually you know, gives them a, a much higher quality force than they would have had, say, you know, had the war started several years earlier, you know, because there's a whole lot more turnover in personnel in the 1920s, you know, and, and some of that just has to do with the fact it's, it's, it's like what we had seen, you know, before the, before the pandemic hit. You know, for, you know, depending on what your specialty was, whether enlisted or an officer, you know, some people, you know, they could get out and make, make quite a bit of money in the private sector. This is why, why the, the, you know, the Navy and the Air Force are losing pilots all the time, you know, because the airlines were, were hiring left and right. But yeah, you know, that, that may change now. Um, you know, so the Navy's kind of, kind of dealing with a, with a similar situation at the, at, at the time as well. The other thing I was also going to point out is, is, you know, the Navy has often struggled, I think, with being an isolated institution within American culture. You know, the, you know they spend a good chunk of the 19th century, uh, you know, deployed on, on foreign ports, you know, the, the squadron system, you know, uh, you know trying to, to uh, you know, support American interests abroad, you know, and so really in the interwar period, the Navy st spends more time uh, home ported in the United States, you know, that helps. But I also think the fact that, that you have, you know, these, these films that are showing different sides of Navy life, they really do a, a good job of, of, show, of kind of normalizing the Navy as, as a respectable institution, also giving the public visibility of an institution that they really haven't had a whole lot of contact with in, in prior decades, because it's either been so small or, or, or deployed overseas. And so, you know, I think for the public, this is really one of the first times they're getting to see the Navy up close uh, uh, during this era. And it's a much larger Navy than really ever before. I mean, we come out of World War One, you know, basically rivaling the British Navy, but going into World War One, we were not in that position, third, maybe, in terms of scope and scale. And, and the concept that we're keeping these, these fleets now after World War One, we're going to maintain a, a battle force, especially after the, 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 the Washington Naval Treaty, that we're going to be in that 5 5 free ratio with the British and the Japanese. And, and, and it's really yeah, a big the, change. Yeah, the peacetime Navy after, yeah, even, even for all the teeth, nath, teeth, uh, teeth na gnashing uh, after Washington and, and just the, 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 I would say the existential shock that, that sends, sends that through the officer corps. Yeah, the, the peacetime Navy even after that is roughly about twice the size as it was in 1914. Right. And the Navy had a huge growth all of a sudden. I mean, actually, during World War One, the U.S. Navy is larger than the Royal Navy in terms of manpower. I, and, and like you said, I think it was very important for them to, to deal with their public relations aspect. It's something they hadn't done, and which I would argue the Army doesn't do a very good job at all. Pershing is terrible with it in World War One, And, and I, I think it really comes back to, uh, to, to haunt them in some ways. I, I want to come back to that technology issue, too, a little bit more and, and talk about that again, because is, is it the public that and Hollywood pushing this this imagery, they want to see this different change of the Navy, or is the Navy really trying to show that hey, we're in the, we're we're an elite force, we're a fighting force, and we're adapting and changing to 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 wage war in the future? Again, we always get, get that mantra that the Navy or the military is preparing to fight the last war. But you watch some of these videos and these movies, in imagery and stories, they're really showing a very kind of advanced force talking about things that are going to be essential for World War II. Yeah, so there's, yeah, so, uh, you know, I, again, using Helldivers, and by the way, it, one of the reasons why I talk about Helldivers so much is the fact that it's actually a fairly big hit in its day, um, and so it stays in circulation for, for quite a while. Back then, you know, you didn't have films opening on two, three, four thousand screens at once. You only had, like, a few prints in circulation, 
but it's uh, but but it's going to be playing for 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 quite a while after its its initial premiere in in December of thirty one. Um, but yeah, so I think on you know again this is where I think you can see both sides. You know, Hollywood I think wants to see something different, you know, from from the Navy, but it also helps that that you know you have Spigweed writing some of these screenplays, and so most of his early screenplays are about naval aviation. Hell Divers is one. Uh, there's uh, flight. Uh, there's flying fleet. Flying fleet actually ends up uh, partially kind of uh, 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 dramatizing the 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 incident with the PN9. You know, uh, from September of 25 when it's uh, presumed lost, but the crew eventually sails it uh, to Hawaii and where where the where the where the plane and the and the uh, and the crew are rescued. Um, so so you so you kind of have this kind of backdoor element, you know, kind of pushing this. Yeah, but Hollywood, I think, is interested in, in, in showing like these visually exciting uh, things, and that really kind of favors naval aviation at the time. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of mileage you can get out of whether or not it's airships. Uh, you know, even as airships are starting to show themselves to be accident prone. Uh, you know, uh, fixed wing aircraft. You know, and it doesn't really work as well with with submarines. There's not too many instances where. Um, you know, Hollywood really wants to show submarines uh, at war. There's there's a uh, there's a film called Hell Below that comes out in the early 1930s that's uh, based on an uh, on an, on an uh, Edward Ellsberg or not Edward so, uh, oh salvage officer Ellsberg. Anyways, uh, yeah, that's based on 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 one of his novels. That's kind of a fictionalized story of a of a U.S. Navy sub during World War One doing a doing a dangerous mission. But for the most part, submarines during the interwar period are kind of seen as accident prone, which kind of reflects you know what the what what the public is seeing in press coverage. And so you you've got a a John an early John Ford film. There's a Frank Capra film, Submarine. Um, uh, uh, the John Ford film is Men Without Women, and in both of them, there's a, there's a submarine that is, uh, 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 you know, sinks, and and so you see, you know, uh, uh, people trying to, you know, trying to uh, mount like a rescue operation against them, and so it's it's a, you know, submarines they have a hard time, I think, creating a lot of visual drama without recalling the horrors of World War One. You know, and 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 you know, and and the post-war uh, kind of reckoning of that when when you see you know at least a a push, an unsuccessful push to ban submarines. You know, but on the other hand, naval aviation really kind of ties into America's you know fascination with flight at the time. You know, and and all things aviation, and so I think the Navy's really able to capitalize uh, uh, on on that through 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 its films. And so yeah, you're you're right. You know, you do see the Navy really trying to project this image of of what they call the three plane Navy, a, 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 a fleet that can dominate the air, uh, the surface, and then and then beneath the waves. And I think a lot of people are coming out of, you know, the World War One era where the submarines were the cause for our entry into World War One, and, and they're seeing that really as, as not a, a, a weapon that should be used, especially the way the Germans used it right there. Let me go to the conclusion then, because one of the things you talk about in the conclusion you basically say is evaluating the effectiveness of the Navy public relations on the eve of war. So how, how good was the Navy in their public relations by the eve of World War Two? Yeah, so one of the things that I found in, in researching this is if you're trying to trace direct effects of, of public relations policies, it's really difficult, you know, and so if you're trying to have a, a you know, a, a very, uh, a very simple, very uh, cause effect relationship, it's not always easy to find that, you know, and so, you know, the enlistment rates get better, but, you know, that's at least in part due to the, due to the depression. You know, the budget situation does get better during the 1930s, but at least in part, that's, you know, we're going to have to attribute that to, to Roosevelt, you know, pushing for this, and, you know, and, and then also all of the New Deal construction spending, you know, things like the Vincent Trammell Act. And so, you know, trying to trace direct effects there. But if you look at the process and the policy, uh, you know, by which the Navy is governing, you know, they, they become more sophisticated and advanced over time, you know, and so this is one thing that 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 is um, that 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 I found really kind of interesting is so so public relations as a as a profession is really growing out in the private sector. The Navy at times seems to be trying to mirror what what the what the private sector is doing, even though it's not really clear that the Navy is always tracking like the most up to date literature that's coming out of of the the private sector PR field. Um, but you know, the, there's a lot of things that they do that actually do reflect like best practices 
of the era. It also helps that the Navy, by virtue of being this, this large prestigious institution, can actually generate a lot of press coverage uh, fairly easily in a way that, that, that other company, you know, that private sector companies or some other government agencies had, had had difficulty with themselves. And so, you know, but in terms of the number of personnel, the, the, the you know, for the most of the interwar period, the, the, uh, the, the information section, which becomes the, the public relations branch in 1931, it's the same thing, they're still part of O&I. Uh, uh, is three officers, a civilian aide, uh, and a, a uh, you know a civilian secretary, and then a marine, uh, an enlisted marine aide. So it's a staff of five, and so uh, this really starts to grow in the 1930s, uh, you know, late 1930s, and so on the eve of war, there's there's dozens of, of personnel uh, in uh, in the public relations branch, and this is also going to be uh, kind of codified, you know, so. Daniels had had the his press office attached directly to him. You know that changes when the Navy kind of militarizes pub, uh, public relations. Uh, it, you know, in 1922, when they create the information section, but it's going to be restored to the Second Nav's office uh, under Knox in May of 1941. Frank Knox, uh, who's a Republican, he's also a former newspaper editor. You know, much like Daniels was, and so he's brought in as kind of this war cabinet. And so Knox uh, uh, takes the old public relations branch, elevates it to the new Office of Public Relations, uh, attaches it to the to the SecNav's office, and and uh, then puts uh, and makes it a flag rank uh, command billet. And so the the first uh, uh, the first commander of the Office of Public Relations is uh, Rear Admiral Arthur Hepburn. You know, and so so yeah, the fact that you actually have this like uh, respected you know uh, flag officer in charge, I think, really does a lot to elevate. Um, a public relations standing. And so there's a lot of, you know, and so again, it, you have to look at kind of the process by which they do things. And so even looking at like the Squalus incident, you know, there's growth there. They, they pivot away from, the, you know, the Navy had been trying to do a big uh, uh, spectacle related to the New York World's Fair at the, uh, when, the, when the Squalus thing goes on. So the fact that they have enough capacity and wherewithal to pivot from trying to do this big, uh, this big public event to, to doing this crisis response at the same time. That is something that, that I do not think would have been possible at almost any point earlier in the interwar period. Uh, so there's a lot of growth and a lot of learning uh, that, that goes on in terms of how do we do this job? What kinds of personnel do we want doing this? You know, the Navy starts to, starts to view public, public relations, public affairs is a post-war term, by the way, uh, but they start to view public relations as kind of a distinct specialty. And so you start to see officers who, who have public relations backgrounds being pushed in to this duty, or they will return to this duty. So, so uh, uh, Leland Lovett, uh, who's the head of the public relations branch in the late 30s, uh, most of his career will actually be in public relations or public affairs. He eventually reaches flag rank largely on his public relations experience. Uh, there's officers who had spent time as junior officers in the early 20s who come back to the uh, public relations branch uh, in the late 30s, early 40s. Uh, so this is their second stint, you know, recognizing that experience. And so the Navy's really starting to, to view this as, as a valuable specialty. The other thing I also do want to say, since, you know, while we're, while we're talking about this, is, you know, because at times it seems as if the policies, you know, dictating uh, uh, their work were, were not well defined, there are instances where, you know, the, 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 the public relations branch, uh, the information section, you know, before it, uh, really starts to push into what we would think almost time, almost at times is like strategic communications. You know, so, so, you know, the, the, you know, the fact that they're kind of buried within the bowels of the bureaucracy, you know, kind of leave, leaves them, you know, a little forgotten, but it also kind of, I think at times insulates them and, and kind of gives them a little bit more freedom, uh, freedom of action. So, you know, they're still going to be at the mercy of, of leaders, you know, when we were talking about the accidents earlier, you know, the press uh, spends a lot of time uh, during the, uh, during the S-4 incident, attacking uh, Secretary of the Navy Curtis Wilbur. Uh, Wilbur, I don't think, really does a whole lot of uh, favors to himself in the way he handles the crisis. But, you know, but this is also a, a kind of a byproduct of, from what I can tell, of him trying to handle this himself as opposed to, you know, devolving any, uh, much, much of uh, any actual authority down to, uh, uh, you know, the, the information section at the time.
Ryan, I, I think it's an impressive work. I, I think you, you've tapped into a topic, again, that I have not thought about in, in large measure, and, and I think it's a great one, especially in the interwar Navy. You know, uh, like, for example, just even mentioning Hepburn right there as, as, as the head, and then he goes on to lead one of the first Pearl Harbor investigations, for example, mm-hmm. a very interesting choice for him to go in there. So I, great to get the book done, great to get the award. What's next? What are you working on now? What can we look forward to to see uh, from you next? So, so one of the other uh, projects I kind of found whenever I was uh, just a, a, a lowly master's student was uh, I became interested in uh, uh, Harry Arnell. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I looked at him for my master's thesis, and, and so it was one of those projects where I realized there's this huge amount of material on, on Harry Arnell uh, at, the, at the History and Heritage Command and also at the Library of Congress. Uh, that it really hasn't been delved into much. And so, so I'm working on a biography of, of Yarnell for those who aren't familiar with, with Yarnell. Um, uh, so he's a, uh, uh, spends time on Sims's staff during World War I uh, and is actually one of the Navy's first war planners after, after the war. Uh, and so, you know, he's got that uh, strategic side. You know, he does, ha- he does get a little bit of influence over submarine policy thanks to a couple of different assignments he takes. Um, during the mid twenties, uh, he he eventually uh, embraces aviation. So he gets uh, so he gets his uh, uh, wings. I think he's, he's he gets one of the observer wings. You know, so like so he's one of what they call the Johnny Come Latelys into aviation. But he becomes one of the Navy's uh, earliest carrier commanders. So he follows <clears throat> uh, uh, Bull Reeves as the commander of the aircraft squadrons of the battle fleet. So Yarnell's in charge of the Lexington and the Saratoga uh, for a few years uh, in the early thirties, and so kind of carrying on that work of you know, what can carriers bring, you know, what do carriers add to the fleet? Uh, and then his final regular assignment is he's the commander of the Asiatic fleet uh, uh, in the late 30s when the Japanese uh, pushed into China beginning in 37. And so he's got this really fascinating career. Uh, speaking of the Pearl Harbor investigation, one of the things Yarnell does in his retirement years is uh, he actually will defend uh, uh, or serve as an advisor to Kimmel uh, during one of the investigations. Your your nail to me always sounds like a proto Kim a uh, king you know he just he, he just seems to be doing everything that a king does just he's a little bit earlier than him very interesting and, career yeah that's exactly I've I've made that I've made that comparison myself yeah. if you look at his career arc it's not that dissimilar from King's it's just he's a few years older yeah. and so whereas King is just barely able to escape uh, uh, the retirement order. Uh, when World War II starts, uh, Yarnell's already uh, already too far gone. Oh, and I think he sets a very interesting precedent in Asiatic Fleet when Hart comes in. He's already set that kind of kind of confrontational st- strategy out there. You know, not really wanting to buck the Jap- not really wanting to give in to the Japanese and their in their their offensive. I, I think he's a great one. I think some a lot of those interwar admirals, in particular, you know, Coons, Yarnell, a few other ones, are really essential to understand. We kind of gloss over them, jump from World War One to World War Two. But they're so in, in, instrumental in really setting up the the, the inner war, the, the navy that's going to fight in World War II. You know, the army does a great job at looking at World War One and how it goes in World War II. I don't think the navy does a great job in many ways of really looking at that experiences going into World War II. We think everything is made and produced in 1942, and and, then, and that's it. Yeah, well, and, and yeah, Yarnell I think does a, does a lot to build the fleet. Um, you know, and, and, and kind of the under, the ideas that underpin that fleet uh, 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 that, that, that eventually goes on to win the war. I mean, he's, he's um, yeah, he's, he's, a, he's a very influential character. It's just he's not really one that has, you know, I think, I think a lot of, you know, really, uh, you know, historians of that era know who he is. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, Navy veterans who know who he is because of, you know, they served on the hay during the, at some point during its uh, during that ship's life, even though I've heard apparently the Hay had sometimes a, a checkered reputation uh, as a ship, uh, but uh, uh, but yeah, he's 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 a very influential uh, f- uh, figure who I who I don't think really has has gotten his due, and and so the fact that there's there's uh, you know there, there's so many of his papers that are out there. Uh, that I've been able to find uh, is, is incredible. Well, Ryan, I'm looking forward to you writing that. Uh, we're going to have uh, uh, Dave Conan on uh, shortly, and he's going to be talking all about King. So I, I, I look forward to matching that with a discussion with you in the near future, all about Yarnell. And I hope to see you down at Pensacola in, in, in the spring, if we have our conference again, for you to give your presentation, talk about this in person, and, and maybe start talking about Yarnell in some more detail. So yeah. if you hadn't had a chance, again, I'm going to recommend, again, the book. Make sure you grab a copy. It is a fantastic read. I, I, I cannot recommend it 
enough. I want to thank our guest, Ryan Wadley, for, for joining us on the NASO Video and Podcast. We'll have links to all Ryan's work in our show notes, so be sure to take a look at that. If you like our video and podcast, be sure to click like on YouTube or give it five stars on the podcast provider. Please subscribe to our channel to receive updates as we continue to interview maritime historians. You can follow NASO on Twitter or at, on NASO on Twitter at NASO underscore history. The best way to follow NASO is to become a member. As such, you'll receive our newsletter, our quarterly journal, Northern Mariner, which we publish jointly with the Canadian Nautical Research Society. Go to www.naso.org and click on membership to join. Until our next talk, Keep sailing.